All right, well, let's get started for tonight's webinar. And uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's informational webinar, The Lacey Experience. I'm Rick Walk, the Community and Economic Development Director for the City of Lacey and Project Manager for Lacey's Work Group on Homelessness. The work group comprises of a diverse group of 30 Lacey community members appointed by the Lacey City Council charged to listen, learn, and discuss the issues of homelessness and develop recommendations for the council. <clears throat> so thank you for joining us for the first in our series of informational webinars on topics related to homelessness in Lacey. Now, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the inability to meet in person, we decided to create this speaker series to support the work group's efforts to gather information throughout the 12 month community driven process that will help shape the recommendations they will make to the Lacey City Council related to homelessness in Lacey. The webinars will feature subject matter experts from our region who will discuss current condition, provide insights to the services available, and offer a variety of perspectives on topics ranging from behavioral health, funding, services, housing, and more. Now tonight's webinar topic is the Lacey Experience. The panel will provide an overview of the status of the current homeless encampments in Lacey from the perspective of the Lacey's, Lacey Police Department's Community Resource Unit and their efforts to engage with Lacey's most vulnerable populations. So I'm really excited about tonight's uh, uh, presentation and I would like to welcome and introduce our speakers here. Uh, first, we have Mitch Mitchell, the Social Services Coordinator, and Mitch serves as the Outreach Coordinator for the City of Lacey. This position is contracted through the Community Action Council of Lewis, Mason, and Thurston County, and is part of the Lacey Police Department's Community Resource Unit, which focuses most of their efforts on assisting Lacey's most vulnerable populations. <clears throat> Prior to joining the police department, Mitch served 25 years in the U.S. Army and retired in January of 2020. Mitch has experience as an applied suicide intervention skill trainer and a master resiliency trainer, and has taught numerous courses worldwide he is a graduate of the U.S. Army Equal Opportunity course, basic healthcare administrator course, and a dental management development course. And he holds a bachelor's of science degree in the occupational education specializing in dental studies from Wayland Baptist University. Mitch is also uh, participates in the community through his uh, service on the board of directors for the Thurston County Youth Football League, as well as the Black Hills Youth Baseball League. Also, we have with us tonight, Officer Alex Fichek with the Community Resources Unit. Officer Fichek has been with the uh, Lacey Police Department for 11 years. He spent his first nine years as a patrol officer and currently serves as a community resource officer. Officer Fichek also is also a department instructor, field training officer, and serves on the Thurston County SWAT team. And since joining the Community Resource Unit in January of 2019, Officer Fichek focuses a majority of his time on the homeless crisis in the community. He was the first staff person to begin tracking Lacey's trends in homelessness to better gauge what resources the city of Lacey uh, needs to address the issues. He is also part of the process of establishing our current municipal codes for camping and RV parking. Officer Fichek not only serves our community, but he also lives here and has a vested interest in the successful growth of the city of Lacey. And finally, we have Officer Justin Biltran, also with the Community Resource Unit. Officer Beltran has been with the Lacey Police Department since July of 2016 and currently serves as a community resource officer. He also serves as, the, as an Explorer Advisor for the Lacey Police Department Explorer Post. He has training in crisis intervention, behavioral health, homeless outreach, outreach and management of aggressive behavior. Prior to joining the Lacey Police Department, Officer Beltran served as a community corrections officer with the Washington State Department of Corrections. In his position, he collaborated with the community justice partners, victims, citizens, and stakeholders to enhance the overall community safety. He supervised high-risk offenders, which included coordinated treatment plans and created intervention strategies designed to positive impact behavior and reduce recidivism. He holds a bachelor's of arts degree in law and justice from Central Washington University. And Officer Biltran also lives in the Lacey community and has a vested interest in its success. So I'm really excited about tonight's uh, speakers. Um, they have, a, as you can tell, a lot, lot of uh, experience and knowledge in, in working with this type of situation. I also want to mention that we also have here tonight uh, Interim Chief uh, Robert Amada, who will also be available for questions and answers uh, for the, the work group members 
And then uh, Megan Picard of the Athena Group will also uh, is here tonight and will have uh, some comments at the end of the, the webinar on next steps as well. So again, uh, everybody, thank you for joining us. We'll start the webinar with the panelists providing an overview of what the community resource unit is, how they interact with the uh, homeless community and the, uh, uh, their experiences in that process. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes for that presentation and then we'll open it up for a question and answer period. Because we're on a webinar format, we are using the question and answer function, which if, if you look at the bottom of your screen, next to the participants tab, you'll see a QA button and you'll be able to post your questions there. Uh, please don't uh, reserve uh, writing your questions until at the end of the presentation, as you hear things or um, think of stuff, please post those questions. And then at the conclusion of, of uh, the, uh, the panelists' uh, presentation, then I'll start monitoring those questions to them so they can respond and have that uh, the dialogue. Uh, again, um, please feel free to submit those questions at any time and with that, let's get started. So I will turn it over to Mitch, who will lead off the presentation, and uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing the comments of the Community Resource Unit. Mitch? Thank you, Rick. Um, good evening. So just to give you a quick overview um, of what the mission of the crew unit is. So the mission of the Lacey Community Resource Unit uh, with me as the embedded outreach coordinator is to respond to homeless people with mental or substance abuse disorders and uh, financial and other service, uh, social service needs. So that's kind of the, the main mission. Um, our goal is to have individuals uh, in need enter, engage, or successfully complete the necessary steps to be able to have a secure residence and to return to being stable productive and healthy individuals within the, the community um, that we support. So that's kind of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of our mission and our goal uh, of the, the community resource unit that is comprised of myself, Officer Fichek, uh, Officer Beltran, and then uh, DA3 uh, Palmer. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into a presentation if I can get my screen shared going. Um, where did they go? All right. So again, community resource unit is made of myself, Officer Beltran, Fichek, and um, DA3 Lindsey Palmer. Um, over the last couple of months, uh, in the last 11 months, the, the Community Resource Unit is a very new program. It started in 2019, like Officer Fichek uh, was and mentioned in his bio, Officer Fichek was the original uh, proponent of that, of the unit. And then I was hired on and then Officer Beltran was brought into the unit. And then we, we brought in uh, Lindsey Palmer to help with uh, some of the administrative things that the unit does. Uh, but over the last 11 months, uh, we've made contact with over 195 individuals. Um, of those 195 individuals, approximately 98 um, have received some type of referral for service, and 49 of them have completed a coordinated entry. And what the coordinated entry is, is a part of the process that allows uh, people that are homeless to gain access to housing resources. Uh, it's about a 45 uh, minute question. Uh, your screen isn't sharing. Oh, yeah. then that is a problem. Thank you for making that known. Um, is it sharing now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Everybody can see that? Perfect, sorry about that. Um, I forgot where I left off, uh, coordinated entry. So that's kind of the pipeline to get people into uh, services that gets them access to the master housing list. Um, uh, coordinated entry is actually being run through Community Action Council. Uh, they are the proponent for managing that for the Thurston County. And again, of all the people that we've uh, made contact with, about 50% have actually engaged in some type of service. 
Uh, and there's various reasons uh, why people don't engage in services and I'll get to that a little here a little bit later. So some of the wraparound services, um, we've provided 32 different uh, referrals to Family Support Center, who is a partner of ours that we utilize when we deal with uh, families or females that are pregnant. Um, and then we deal with the community youth services. Here in the Lacey community, we really don't encounter a lot of youth, um, as many as, as much as the city of Olympia does, uh, but we have made six referrals to them and we have a very good partnership with uh, community youth services. Uh, we've also helped four uh, personnel in our behavioral health treatment. And I have received word just yesterday that one of the individuals uh, is doing very well with his, uh, his rehab program. And they've also found him long-term housing outside of Thurston County. So I'm looking forward to seeing what type of success that brings for him. Uh, we've had some people that we've dealt with that have entered into drug and alcohol treatment. Um, and I'll get onto that a little bit here later. Uh, we've been able to help with hygiene services, uh, Sacred Heart Catholic Church here in the city of Lacey off of Balker Street provided uh, shower services uh, for quite some time. And that was a very successful program. And I hope that we can get back to that program later on um, in a year uh, after things kind of calm down with the cold weather. Um, we've also had uh, success with getting people over to getting COVID testing, animal services, as well as uh, after there was a suicide in one of the camps, we were able to provide, uh, link uh, those individuals up with some grief counselors. So again, uh, we've been able to get a number of people housed and or relocated, and there's various different programs throughout uh, the county and different agencies that we're partnered with that can help with that. And one of those agencies that helps with uh, a safe ride home is, uh, 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 just draw a blank. Uh, anyway, there's a, there's a work group that we work with very closely. They've been able to provide bus tickets home for some individuals. Uh, there's two individuals that uh, Officer Beltran and Fichek and I have been very, very closely with, working closely with that actually will leave uh, tomorrow and go back to Indiana. So that's very successful uh, transition for those individuals. Um, but we've also, we've also been able to do some uh, clothing donations and get people uh, uh, various clothing items when they need them. We've partnered again with Sacred Heart and St. Mike's Catholic Church, and we're able to help doing those things. Um, we've also been able to provide uh, money and financial uh, support through some little minor programs to help with purchasing fuel uh, in times of need during the cold weather. So some of the successes that we've been able to do in the camps. Uh, so prior to connecting with people in the camps, uh, there was no one engaging with these individuals in the city of Lacey, other than when they would make contact with law enforcement or uh, make contact with uh, 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 first responders. So once the unit started, that's when we started making those contacts with those individuals. Um, so in this time frame, we've been able to build that trust and confidence between them. Uh, sometimes when we go into camps, the first thing they see is they see someone that looks like a police officer and they immediately shut down and they don't want to have a conversation or be forthright with their identity. Um, because some of these individuals uh, may have a uh, uh, police record. Um, some do, some do not, and they just don't want to provide that information. They're just not very trusting. Um, we were also able to, last year in the homeless point in time count, we were able to provide uh, a point in time event that we partnered with one of the churches and we had the families come in. As some of you may know, the McKinney Vento, uh, we don't get the opportunity to count our youth in our homeless numbers. We have to allow the school district and them to provide that type of information. So we decided as a crew unit that we'd put on an event to support uh, kind of making that connection with those families. And it was a, a well-attended event. 
Uh, we had six external agencies come out to provide uh, support. Uh, we had someone to do coordinated entry. We had agencies that were there to provide information about attaining uh, a health insurance. And it was well received and it helped us to capture those individuals that would not normally participate in an event. So that was one of the major successes, I think, of this past year, especially with the point in time of that. So as I mentioned earlier, we was gonna talk about some of the challenges. Um, some of the challenges that we face when we're dealing with our homeless population is, uh, it's very difficult for individuals to remain engaged in services. Um, for the common person, it's easy to kind of follow up with things that we do on a daily basis. But when you're living on the street, living in a tent, um, you, you don't have that full uh, support and resource to maintain those resources. I mean, if, if we write something down on a piece of paper and we leave it on our, our desk, we know where that piece of paper is going to be when we come back to it. When you're homeless, you don't have that opportunity. So we're finding that a lot of that is we have to continue this relationship to make sure that we engage them because they're not gonna engage services on their own. And then there's barriers to sustainable housing. Um, if someone has an eviction history, a criminal history, they have a lot of debt. Those are major barriers when we're trying to get someone housed in the future. Uh, obviously substance abuse and behavioral health, um, those two kind of go hand in hand and it makes it challenging to uh, keep people engaged in what they need to be focused on. Um, again, what me and the, the lay person focus on on a day-to-day -day basis is not what someone that uh, has a behavioral health crisis or is experiencing substance abuse, that's not a priority of them. Um, there's a lot of people that just don't know what they don't know until they know. Uh, and that's where you get to the, the fear of the unknown. Uh, those, you know, they don't know if, okay, if I talk to Officer Fichek, is he going to help me? Or if I talk to Officer Fichek, is he going to, you know, look into my history and, and, and that's his main focus is trying to arrest me for something I did 10 years ago, or is it he's trying to get me to services? So that fear of the unknown, uh, we deal with that on a daily basis. And then there's the systematic failures in the system. Um, there's approximately 800 uh, people in our homeless database, 800 to 900 people in our homeless database in the city of Lacey or in Thurston County right now. And that's a lot of individuals that need access to care and access to services. But if they don't have a phone or they don't have their phone charged or they don't have access to maintain those things, uh, they kind of fall off in the system. And when they fall off from the system, the system then in turn fails them because there's no mechanism to reach them. And that's kind of where the crew unit has come into place. Um, I receive referrals a lot asking, hey, can you guys go out and find, um, you know, Officer Beltran, can you find this one individual that we've been trying to track down because we know this person is vulnerable and they need assistance. So we were able to go out and into the camps and look for those individuals. So again, mobility, um, there's a lot of different camps throughout the county. And when someone doesn't feel safe in a camp or they've overstayed their welcome in that camp, uh, they leave. And then it's very difficult to try to track them down because it's not like they you know, send a, a forwarding postcard to the post office and says, hey, I'm leaving this residence and I'm going to this other one. So it's very difficult to maintain um, contact with them. Um, maintaining important documents. Uh, we get a lot of requests for people asking for IDs and copies of DD Form 214s, um, which is the military record, uh, birth certificates and social security card. Uh, because again, they don't, they're, they're, they're unable to leave an item here and it be picked up somewhere else, um, or they know it left it on the desk when they left their camp or they left it in, the, on their, in their tent, when they come back, all their things are stolen. Um, and then a lot of unreported identity theft happens in the camps. Um, we, we hear about it on a daily basis. My wallet was stolen. This was stolen. This is being used by someone else, my cell phone. 
So all of these are some of the, the challenges that we notice on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so these are just a list of the camps that we work on a daily basis. It's, it's not all inclusive. However, uh, throughout our travels and our day-to-day -day, um, operations, we do kind of hit most of these locations on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're just looking to see who's out there, who needs our help, who needs referrals to services. Um, and we also have been called in to do uh, our job in other areas outside of the city limits. Uh, we received phone calls from the city of Tumwater asking for support when um, one of their areas was over inundated with campers. Uh, we've dealt with washed out properties and other locations. So we're not just uh, uh, romantically focused on just the city of Lacey. Um, if we can su provide support to somewhere else, uh, we try to do that. So uh, we're just not uh, Lacey centric. So that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of, of kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, where we're at, uh, the state of the homelessness in, in the city of Lacey. Um, and I'm gonna open it back up to you, Rick, and any other questions. Okay, and I just wanna give opportunities for um, Officer Beltran or Officer Feech, if they wanna add anything uh, else to the presentation. I'm seeing a no. So, uh, oh. oh, yes. I guess I, I guess I could step in. Um, so, um, a lot of what we've been dealing with lately um, with the eviction moratorium uh, come in place. So, as much as we deal with our homeless people face to face, we hear a lot from our apartment complexes, our community members of people that are, you know, living in alternate situations, whether it's they're uh, couch surfing or they're living in an RV in the roadway. Um, and so a lot of those numbers that Mitch uh, touched on earlier don't necessarily reflect how much impact we've, we've, we've made because we've referred a lot of people to the CAC who in turn have requested assistance with um, eviction prevention. So we help people um, before they end up on the streets and we help people before their electricity gets shut off. And so there's a lot of numbers that we don't know how we impact, but those are, those are people that we're dealing with day in, day out uh, via email, via phone call. And um, there's, there's kind of no limit to who reaches out to us and kind of Mitch's our, our funnel to all of our services throughout the county. Great, thank you. And, and you know, see the CRU program has been around since the early parts of 2019, if I remember correctly. And you can see there's a, a lot of work done and looks like a lot of the work has to be developing relationships is, is my understanding. So I do appreciate all the work and, and the presentation by Mitch and the, the community resource unit. We do have um, some questions, uh, but one question I wanna just kind of reemphasize re maybe is, is Mitch in your presentation, you mentioned all those different campsites you, you visit on a regular basis. What is the range of size of those various encampments? And uh, is there a, a general number of, of population within the city of Lacey that you are servicing, that you are aware of? So each camp is gonna present itself in a, uh, a, a different light, just de depending on the, the size of property that they have access to. Um, if it's just, you know, a storefront or if it's an actual camp. Um, so typically if it's a large, a uh, piece of property, and I don't want to identify necessarily, you know, the, those areas, but uh, large pieces of property, we can see anywhere from three to 20 campsites on that piece of property. Uh, and it's funny because we'll, we'll go into a camp or an area that we've walked numerous times, and this we'll take the same route, and we'll walk it one day, and boom, we'll stumble upon 
a large camp that hadn't been there. And so it's, it's always evolving. It's always growing. When something happens in the city of Olympia, it definitely affects the city of Lacey. It affects the city of Tumwater. Uh, so the camps just, they grow um, and, and they shrink just as fast. Um, because once the site gets over inundated with debris and it becomes uninhabitable, then people, you know, egress to another location. Forgot about that pesky mute button. <laughs> the, um, uh, thank you. And there was, have been several questions that came in from the, uh, the audience and I'll start going through those questions and then, um, and see how many more uh, populate. So the first question that came in was a question related to uh, the invisible homeless. And the, the question was, does the CRU also serve invisible, invisible homeless in Lacey? And I believe the invisible homeless is, is uh, referring to those that you don't see in the encampments that are very visible to the traveling public. Um, so not only do we go into the camps, uh, when we're driving around town, if, we come across someone that we collectively, uh, because I can't make a decision without conferring with the officers. When we're rolling around town, we discuss, do we think this person's homeless? Do we think this person needs services? And nine times out of 10, it's just like, well, let's ask anyway. You know, what's the worst thing they can tell me is I'm not homeless. I have a home, I, I'm just down on my luck. I don't look as everyone else quote unquote should look. And it's like, okay, I'm sorry, my apologies, and, and we move on. Um, but we do, I think we do a pretty good job of trying to identify those that are not in the camps that, that need assistance and need support. Great. So our next question um, is related to once you connect people to services after about four or five years, what percent of the people are still successful in those programs? Um, do you see them as everyone they're connected to the services? Are they able to stick through it? Or do you see a lot coming back into the uh, homeless population? So since, since I've only been doing this for, uh, for one year, uh, we've had some successful uh, people gravitate towards uh, uh, receiving services from Community Action Council, receiving services from crew and have maintained their residency. Um, so the numbers or the percentage over a long period of time is gonna be very difficult to uh, extract. Uh, but I can say that, you know, of the 195 people that we've been able to uh, encounter over these last couple of months, uh, only about, I mean, 13 of them we were able to get housed. So uh, it's, 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 the math doesn't look good, but if we can affect one individual's life and get them off the streets, then I think that's a huge success. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, and I might need to have some clarification from Ed Pollard Asset, but the question you put forward is, would a standard packet with needed information uh, to be carried by homeless help or work. And I'm assuming that means a standard packet in the sense of resources and information that they can use access, access services. Is that correct? And if you give a thumbs up to the question, I'd appreciate it. Did you get that? I did not, and uh, so I think that the, the intent of the question was, is there a standard packet of information that is used to um, provide to, to those in need, and, and if not, what type of packet would be useful, if, if at all? So I'm gonna try to do a screen share again. Uh, let's see if I can pull it off this time. Screen share. So this is one of the Thurston County resource lists that we provide to individuals. Can y'all see that on your screen? Yes. 
Okay. So this is just one example of a community resource list that we can access to give individuals. Um, there's also another uh, thorough list that is updated every year um, that just has a myriad of resources. Uh, I mean, this, this list goes on and on. So this information is uh, available to us at a moment's notice. Uh, we all have it uh, on our phones. I also carry some of these examples or copies with us when we go out. So we do have the ability to uh, get that to individuals. Okay, and then you did also clarify too, uh, something similar to a wallet or a travel wallet that they can keep their important information on them at all times. So it, we don't provide them with anything like that. Um, a lot of the individuals lose their wallets on a daily basis. They lose cell phones daily. Um, and I, I don't think it's so much uh, things are being stolen. It's just they're forgetting where they left them. Uh, we've had reports of um, all my items were stolen outside of the, the gas station when I went in to buy cigarettes. Well, we don't know who took those items or if someone realized or, or assumed those items were garbage and threw them away or, or whatnot. So um, it's very difficult for them to maintain those type of items uh, when they do have wallets and, and, and bill folds. Uh, we always remind them, keep those things close to your vest. Um, I've, we've had individuals ask, hey, can you guys keep a copy of this information for me so that I can come back to you to get it in case it gets lost? Good. And our next question, it might be uh, uh, well served for Chief Almada. The, uh, the question is, it sounds like you're incredibly busy. How many more people do you need? Question, question mark. I don't know. Well, yeah, we are incredibly busy. I think that's a good observation. Um, yeah, I think it's important to note that uh, although CRU is our, folk, is, our, is our tip of the spear on this particular issue of homelessness and outreach, uh, all of our officers are engaged in, in homelessness outreach at some level. Uh, actually, community caretaking is one of our, our biggest functions at the Lacey Police Department. Uh, recent example, one of our officers during the overnight hours uh, came across a homeless individual. His shoes have been taken from him. It was soaking, he was soaking wet. It was some 30 degrees outside. Uh, so that officer went out and uh, using our, our true responder um, services, was able to purchase items for that person. So they, were, they had shoes on their feet and uh, some dry clothing. So all of our officers engage in this activity um, and then try to put that person in touch with homeless services. So uh, it's not just, you, CRU is the tip of the tip of the sphere on this particular issue, but all of our officers engage in this, in this activity. Thank you. And, and, and uh, as we uh, learn more about the situation and have more of those encounters, we're always looking at what are those resource needs are and trying to figure out ways to um, make our system more robust. All right, our next question is, the, does the community resource unit cover the Lacey UGA as well? The same, and the question mark, and then the second part of that question, the same way. And I know Mitch, you mentioned in your presentation working with Olympia and Tumwater sites, but what about coordination with the county and in the unincorporated UGA of Lacey UGA. Well, actually, I'll let uh, the officers discuss the, you know, where we are with the UGAs. I can touch on that a little bit. Um, so Mitch kind of hit on this a little bit earlier today, talking about um, how we're not just kind of centered to Lacey, we get brought pretty much everywhere. Um, through our experience with this unit, um, we've learned that a lot of the homeless camps that are in the UGAs, they directly affect the city of Lacey because those people are um, coming in our city, they're going to our businesses, uh, we're getting calls for service, uh, services for them. Um, so through this experience, uh, we have gone to the UGAs um, with Mitch. We've contacted those individuals and we've actually partnered with uh, the county on a couple of our sites uh, to work with them to help those individuals find resources. All 
All right. And this uh, next question also probably goes towards either uh, Officer Fichak, Biltran, or Chief Amada. Um, what does the Lacey uh, Community Response Unit and Police Department do about trespass trespassing complaints from private homeowners or landowners? I'll grab that one as well. Uh, so uh, private, uh, private property compared to city property um, is completely different for us. So um, I can use an example on that one. If a, a business calls and they say they're having issues with people uh, parking their RVs and camping on their property and they don't allow that, um, that process that we uh, do with them is we have them fill out a trespass warning form and also draft a trespass authorization form. That allows the city of Lacey and our police officers to enforce trespassing on that private property because that property owner has signed a trespass order with us, giving us uh, that authority. Great. Thank you, Officer Pichak. So our um, next question has to deal with the um, exit, uh, exit uh, 108, the um, what's known as the Hamburger Hill and Slater Kenny with the uh, with, is that within the city of Lacey city limits? And the answer to that is, is yes. And then the follow-up question to that is, uh, what is going ongoing with trash collection um, on the site? They know that there's been a, one effort to clean up some of the garbage and trash there, but what's the ongoing plan for trash cleanup at that location? So there's a couple of different things that go on with trash, trash collection on that site. So. Uh, Just Housing Olympia is an organization that gets out and kind of does a little bit of the cleanup and a little bit of the outreach um, throughout the county. Uh, there's not a set schedule of pickup days. Um, there is a uh, person that's trusted in that camp to kind of alert um, uh, Just Housing Olympia of the, the um, amount of garbage. And they try to get out and do a, a sweep. Uh, we've also noticed that Thurston County has a, uh, a crew that if they have a half load when they're going to the dump, those guys try to swing by there and pick up things if, if it's, you know, if they have room and space to do it. It's not a, you know, it's not on a, on a schedule or anything to that nature as, as it was explained to us, but they do try to do their part to help clean that up. Uh, and it's like I said, it's not it's not on a set schedule, uh, but there is a there is a mess there now. I I noticed that earlier today myself. Um, so we will definitely be reaching out to someone to see if they can uh, do some type of uh, policing of that area. All right. Let's see, next question is a kind of more of an open ended question, and it might be uh, one that all of you can touch upon. The question is, what is the number one thing Lacey should do from your perspective in, in the homeless response? What is the most critical path? I'll, I'll answer this one last. <laughs> I'm gonna defer to Mitch on this one. He's an expert. Then I guess I'll answer now. Um, uh, it's hard to say one thing um, because um, defining homelessness and, and what um, someone needs or what basic needs are of a, a, the, a daily life um, is too difficult to uh, wrap up in one statement. Um, affordable housing um, would be very beneficial, um, but we know that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time to to build and and get past and and you know there's just so much money tied to that, but if we could increase uh, shelter space and we can increase hygiene services, I think those two things are huge in the community. Um, I know that after a long day of work, um, it feels good to be able to take a shower and and just kind of get the day off of you, and not being able to do that and not being able to have uh, a toilet to sit on or uh, to be able to perform those human functions with uh, 
some type of dignity. Uh, those things, uh, us house personnel or house folks, we take for granted. Um, and those people cherish those opportunities to do those things. So I think those are two of the biggest, you know, for me, from my perspective, hygiene services uh, and some type of uh, long-term supportive housing. Uh, those are two main things that I think that we uh, really love for. All right. And anybody else have anything to add on to that? Okay. So the, the next question is probably for you as well, Mitch. It's, um, it's a question of whether the Community Action Council, a Thurston County agency or a City of Lacey agency, and there's not a City of Lacey agency, but if you can explain more about the Community Action Council and the area it covers, um, I think that'd be helpful for the, the work group. Okay. So um, Community Action Council uh, serves Lewis, Mason and Thurston County. Um, it is a, uh, nonprofit organization um, that receives grants to manage homelessness systems throughout the county. Um, they're in charge of the housing and central needs program, the uh, uh, rapid rehousing program, the eviction, uh, the ERAP program. Uh, Monarch is also part of our uh, our agency um, in a sense, as well as the WIC program. So Community Action Council is a, uh, is, is a conglomerate of, of resources to help people in need here in Thurston County. Great, thank you. Um, another question is the resource list that you uh, shared, Mitch, is it available on the Community Action Council website? But also I'll just add on to that, that um, I will send that out along with, along with the presentation materials uh, to all the work group members so they have that information as well. But is that the uh, resource list, is it, uh, where is it located for somebody in the community could find if they didn't have it already? That's actually a great question. Um, I do not frequent Community Action Council's website just because I'm, an, I, I just don't frequent our, our website. Um, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, on this, uh, this is actually on the crisisclinic.org's website is where this is actually pulled from the Thurston County Community Services list. Um, and then the other list may be on Community Action Council's list because that is part of the Thurston Thrives organization that um, Community Action Council works closely with. Thank you. So this also, this might be a question for uh, Chief Almada. I believe, so the question is, can you talk about the case manager position referred to in the Olympian newspaper? I, I'm assuming that's tied to the presentation from last Thursday night's council meeting and uh, the potential for adding a, an additional position. Uh, Chief, would you wanna take a, a shot at answering that question? I think what they're referring to is the, the addition of a mental health caseworker um, that we're currently exploring. Uh, Mitch is working on that right now. We're kind of looking to see if uh, that capacity exists within uh, CAC that, that we could also enlist a person much like Mitch, but only in the uh, uh, directed mental health provider so that we could do actually uh, on the street outreach uh, beyond what we're doing right now. Currently our officers come in contact with somebody who has a uh, mental health crisis and then generally has to bring them to a facility. It would be nice to have that caseworker be able to do that work directly in the field uh, embedded with the police department. So that's something we're exploring right now. Great, thank you, Chief. All right, the next question is, would it, uh, would it be helpful to, to do a drive to collect battery packs for cell phones or provide a charge pack to camp dwellers or other maybe other resources that may be necessary to the community can uh, collect and donate? Uh, either uh, Alex or Justin, you guys want to talk about your uh, clothing campaign and some other uh, collection drives you guys have been working on? Yeah, so um, as far as battery packs go, that's might be kind of difficult because everybody has different types of phones and um, 
our, our biggest issue is finding a place for these people to actually um, maintain their chargers or, or maintain that outlet. So, I mean, that could be a possibility, but um, overall it's, I, the, the problem is with them losing their belongings. <laughs> I think that's, that's our, our first, first issue. And then in regards to other resources, um, we, we currently partner with um, Sacred Heart. So we do uh, clothing donations because currently they're running a men's only shelter seven days a week. And it's Monday through Thursday at St. Mike's and then Friday through Sunday at Sacred Heart. And they're always in need of resources. So um, kind of what we do is we, we get resources like uh, anything from, from men's, women's and, and kids because we could take that all and disseminate that um, to whoever's in need. But uh, men's clothing is our, our biggest issue right now. Great, thank you. So Rick, just on that one point, kind of tail ends on yep. uh, what Mitch was talking about, you know, as far as um, short-term, long-term, you know, mid-term and long-term uh, responses to homelessness. And uh, really what we've seen is successful and what we kind of like to work towards is a, a centralized facility where people could come in, get the hygiene services, come in, recharge their phones, and at the same time, get coordinated entry, start getting access to services, start developing those trust relationships so that we can get them out of homelessness and move in, into social services uh, and serve towards breaking down those barriers versus giving them a battery pack that they're going to go lose better to come to a place where they can charge their phones and get services yeah great great point so the next question is and i'm not sure if anybody can answer this um and this this topic might be a, under the a future uh, webinar where we'll have it on local government and emergency services. But the question is, how many responses a week on average does the fire department make to homeless encampments in Lacey and the UGA? I, I know I don't have that information from Fire District 3. Uh, I don't, I asked the panelists if any of you may have any of that information. If not, we can also make sure that that's covered in our future webinar with the impacts to local government and services. Yeah, I don't have that type of data other than the, the, the calls that we have made ourselves. Yes, and we do know that there has been some in, in, in the last couple of months of, of fires and responses, both from um, the police department as well as Fire District 3. And we'll see if we can get that information, but also make sure that we uh, pull that as part of the topic of a future webinar presentation as well. So the, um, the next question is a, a little bit of a, a statement looking for comment, but it seems like the bulk of homelessness are not quote unquote street people and they are mostly likely to respond positive help. Um, how do you put resources where, uh, where they will have the most effect? And uh, the, um, and it's a, I think it's more of a, a statement, open-ended statement, but what are the resources and where will they have the most effect in that system that when you connect them to the system? Um, what, is, what is that priority for, for assistance for people to, to gain those resources? So it's difficult to put the resources where uh, they will have the most effect in the sense of, uh, I'll just use the, the list as an example. Um, uh, if a, if we encounter a business owner or a church or someone that has made contact with us about an individual, uh, we've provided that resource list to them so they can actually post that resource list on the front door of their establishment or their church so that when someone does come up, they can actually just look at it and say, okay, well, I need to get in touch with this individual or this agency or something to that effect. Again, it goes back to having that working cell phone or having access to uh, those uh, resources that'll make it easier for them. During this time of COVID with everything shutting down and the library shutting down, uh, the drop-in centers uh, downtown shutting down, that really put a, 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 a stranglehold on allowing individuals to uh, gain access to resources. 
Um, you don't realize how uh, important having access to Wi-Fi is until you don't have it. Um, I know if uh, any of us that have children can understand that comment. Um, the moment that Wi-Fi goes out, it's 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 World War III. So, um, but not having access to those uh, resources and not having access to DSHS and not having access to Community Action Council, uh, it, it puts a lot of these guys at a disadvantage that they're already experiencing. So, um, uh, putting the resource list uh, on a website that they can't access isn't always going to help. Um, if they don't have access to the website. But I, I think that we could definitely look into getting that to the public affairs um, personnel to have them add that resource list if it's not already on the city of Lacey's website, as well as Community Action Council's website. I think it's a great idea. Yes, and we, we, we can look at setting up a, a page on the city of Lacey website with these resources, as well as more information on the Lacey's uh, homeless work groups uh, process as well. Um, got a question that's addressed to Chief Almada. Uh, what can be done to assist the people in encampments who have outstanding warrants to resolve those warrants without arresting them? That's the first question. And the second part of it is Lacey PD reaching out to other law enforcement agencies to see if there are other, like how they how they respond to the, to the issue of warrants. That's a great topic. Uh, it really depends on what the warrant's for, right? Is it a warrant because they were engaged in conduct related to homelessness and they received a citation, they went to warrant? Or are you talking about failure to appear for a felony matter? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things going on with there, right? So with the folks with low level issues, um, I can tell you that, especially during a time of COVID, there's not a, a lot of, uh, hurry to deal with those type of issues. Um, but the more serious warrants and dangerous to society and people with violent, uh, violent offenses, those type of things, uh, those are being enforced. Um, but I can tell you that uh, we're not looking to criminalize homelessness. That's not uh, what the Lacey Police Department's about. And I really don't think the trend in law enforcement is to do that either. Great, thank you. and. Uh... That is, it's one thing that is a, I think a testament to the work of the Lacey Police Department and developing the community resource unit and, and Mitch's work with that unit is that there's been a lot of effort out there to, to uh, develop those relationships, develop the, look at the situation on the ground and start being able to connect people to resources, but also just manage, not manage it, but to, uh, to um, get a better understanding of what it is out there and then as we start developing this this plan on addressing homeless issues in in the community, so I do really appreciate um, everybody's work. The um, the follow up that on that question, Chief Amada, is a concern on the warrants is that it is a huge barrier to receiving re resources and getting housed. So that whether they see police department how they respond to a warrant depend on the degree. How's the the issue of warrants affect somebody's um, ability to uh, receiving resources through the system that's in place currently. I don't know if that's might be Mitch or, or Chief or. Yeah, Mitch, you want to speak to low level warrants and uh, how that affects coordinated entry? Right, yes, sir. So coordinated entry, um, there's a few questions on there about having a criminal background and if that's going to affect um, them being housed. Um, if I can remember correctly, one of the questions uh, specifically asked the individual, uh, do they have anything going on that is going to prevent them from being housed, um, uh, legal matters that are going to affect them being housed? Now, no matter how they answer that question, uh, it's not going to preclude them from receiving services. Uh, we've helped individuals get into uh, long-term housing that have uh, now developed a criminal past or a criminal history and they they're, they're continuing to receive services so again it's not a it's not a well you committed a crime and now we're going to cut you off and you're not going to receive services anymore um, they're still going to receive services 
our coordinated entry specialist actually um, uh, schedules time to go to the, the jail um, to make sure that when individuals that are that are incarcerated when they're coming out of jail, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're doing a coordinated entry and they have access to those resources uh, because a lot of them do become homeless uh, immediately after being released. Um, it's not the, the uh, job of the uh, Department of Corrections to release an individual to a house location. It's their responsibility to uh, release those individuals that have served their time where they've been uh, they've been dismissed from the, the criminal justice system. So um, it's it's nice to have a coordinated entry specialist in the city, uh, in the county that actually makes those connections. Great, thank you. Well, I know that we don't have any more questions coming in. I just wanna take this opportunity before we transition to the next steps piece to um, allow any of our panelists to have one, any final thoughts or comments. Um, and then uh, if not, then we can always uh, go on to their next piece. So uh, anybody have any final comments or thoughts for tonight? No? Yes, Chief Almada. I just wanna thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I get to highlight the good works my folks are doing here in CRU. Uh, they're in the trenches every day. They're out there talking to folks. They're helping folks every day. And, and a lot of it's really uh, unseen and unsung. So I really appreciate the fact that we have to highlight some of the great work tonight. So thank you. Yes, and, and thank you for uh, you guys being here tonight as well. For now, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Megan Picard. She's our facilitator with the Athena Group. She is the uh, one that's been facilitating the, the conversation along with her uh, um, um, uh, co-worker uh, uh, Paul Horton to facilitate the conversation with the group group on developing these um, topics and discussions and learning process for the issues around homelessness. So with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Megan who will talk to the, the work group about what are the next steps in filling out the, uh, the um, learning reflections document. So Megan. Uh, thanks so much, Rick. And thanks to all the speakers. If I can indulge for just one more minute, I actually have a follow-up question. Um, that I think can be answered um, super quickly before I go into those final steps. Is that okay? Yes. Um, great. Um, so I was curious if um, we're talking, there's a lot of talk about like getting the information out about resources, which is really important. And I'm wondering if um, you ever try to connect people with services um, or, or um, helping them to find whatever that, it, that they're they need and find that it's not available? Uh, and if so, what uh, resources have you found are most difficult uh, to connect people with in, in the community? So uh, funding for housing is always a, a kind of a, a depleting service. Um, obviously, we go through all these fiscal uh, year of money and and once the money's gone it's gone and um, we've all know that it, at the end of a fiscal cycle if you haven't used that money uh, it goes away so uh, trying to make sure that the housing case managers at community action council um, are running their programs effectively to make that money stretch longer or that funding stretch longer is is beneficial uh, the problem is there's more people that need the funding than there is of the funding. So uh, we always run into that lull of, you know, a couple of months of, you know, everything's tied up in, at the end of the fiscal year. We just have no resources, we have no money um, because we, we try to help or Community Action Council tries to help everyone that they encounter. Um, and, it, and it's heartbreaking to uh, find an individual that you know needs that assistance and then there's there's no funding for them, uh, so that's that's always a challenge, and and I think that's one of the biggest resources that that actually runs out. Um, I think at the end of the day, if we needed to feed someone or clothe someone, uh, we can always do that. Um, uh, by you know the True Responders program is is a, is a perfect example of how we how we can make that happen, and our clothing donations can make those happen. But it's that that real funding to get someone into a 
uh, long-term housing. Um, we, we've been pretty successful with getting people into shelter, uh, going through all the COVID protocols to get them in, um, and then trying to get people into that transitional housing. Um, that's, that's been a little difficult as well. Uh, but again, we need more supportive housing in this community uh, to get individuals into. Awesome. Thank, thank you for elaborating on, on that. I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, that, that was really helpful. In fact, the whole presentation was, was helpful and really appreciate all of you all being here uh, tonight to talk with uh, the work group members and respond to all of their great comments. And work group members, also, thank you uh, for, for paying attention and asking questions. And now it's time to take five minutes to reflect on what you heard and record your learning in the reflection document shared with you on Basecamp. Um, so by the way, it was originally posted as a downloadable document. It is now a Google Doc. We'd like everyone to share their reflections in that one place on that one Google Doc. And to get started, we just want you to take a moment to consider everything you've heard. What did you learn? What's important to remember as we develop goals and strategies to address homelessness here in Lacey? What's, and what's important to share with the broader community in the open house that we're planning for um, uh, a little later in the winter? As you think about that, add brief statements or um, headlines that might uh, represent that learning in the reflection document. And of course, if you see something that somebody else wrote that um, really uh, already says it, go ahead and you know, add your initials at, at the end of that just to uh, indicate that you, you agree with that statement. Then considering all of the learning, including any learning that other work group members shared, um, consider, you know, does it, does it actually bring to mind any goals or principles that we ought to include in Lacey's community-driven plan on homelessness? If so, go ahead and add your ideas there. Remember, this is just a beginning list. Ideas are ideas, and we'll be able to discuss those as a group and, and refine them as we go forward. But in this particular place and this particular document, Please, any ideas you have about goals or principles, just try to keep them really directly relevant to the learning from this session. So with that, I will stop and turn it back to Rick to close us out. Great, thank you, Megan. And again, thank you to uh, Mitch and Officer Beltran and Officer Pichak, as well as Chief Amana for being here tonight. What a great presentation and, and question and answer period. Thank you to our work group members for being engaged and answering, asking those questions. Uh, I think this will be very helpful. Also, just as a reminder, um, as we said it uh, before, but we'll provide uh, the work group members with copies of the presentation materials, as well as some of the information shared on here, like the community resource list. And then this, um, this um, um, webinar has been re is recorded and we posted to Basecamp. So those work group members that weren't able to attend tonight can still be able to have the opportunity to uh, view it and participate in not only the uh, learning reflections and the Google document work, but also at the upcoming work group meeting on December 1st. Uh, also, it was touched upon, and there, this is the first in a series of webinars or speaker series related to the homeless issues surrounding uh, City of Lacey and, and the region. Our next uh, uh, webinar topics is gonna to be on, the, on behavioral health. We'll have um, subject matter experts that with mental health, addiction and then the overall system of service related to behavioral health. Right now we have that tentatively scheduled for December 7th. We're going to try to keep this webinar series on a Monday night schedule going forward. And then after that, um, we will look to have a local government sector, which I alluded to earlier in the webinar, um, which will have uh, the uh, present presenters representing the, the city of Lacey, uh, as well as uh, uh, the police department and the fire district to talk about the role of local government and emergency services and how that is affected with with the response to homelessness as well. So there's a quite a bit of information coming up. So I really appreciate the work group members being able to attend tonight and participate. And with that, uh, we'll sign off for tonight. And thank you again, everybody, for for this webinar. And stay tuned for more information in the future. Good night.